ad will capacity be for container shipping in 2024? Is the dry bulk sector set for a rebound? Will the tanker sector continue to enjoy days in the sun in 2024? Will new building orders continue to rise? All these and much more in the Sea Trade Maritime Podcast Markets Outlook episode for 2024. It's Marcus Hand, editor of Sea Trade Maritime News, with our first episode of the Sea Trade Maritime podcast for 2024. We are kicking off the year with our popular markets outlook episode with the team from Maritime Strategies International. You'll be hearing from Adam Kent, Daniel Richards, Will Frey, and Tim Smith, who will be discussing the outlook in the coming year for container shipping, dry bulk shipping, tankers, and shipbuilding. Before we drill down into these specific sectors, we'll be starting with a broad macroeconomic outlook from Adam Kent. Welcome back to the podcast, Adam. Hi, Marcus. Thank you for having us back. It's it's great to be here. uh, And thanks again for inviting us. Yeah, really looking forward to sort of sharing your views on what's coming up in 2024 with our listeners. So perhaps you could kick us off with a broad macro view of the outlook for shipping in 2024. Purely from a macroeconomic perspective, at a global level, GDP growth has sort of remained quite mediocre over the course of 2023, uh, especially for the goods producing sectors. But at the same time, the economy has been far from recessionary. As we know, interest rates in advanced economies remain elevated, but they're, of course, starting to return to more normal levels. Uh, If we focus in on some of the the sort of major macroeconomic regions, the US has continued to outperform, but there are signs that this is starting to slow. Labour markets in the US are beginning to cool. Unemployment rate is starting to tick up. And we would say that the risk on the US remain weighted to the downside. I think 2024 could be a challenging year for the US. The Chinese economy is underwhelming. The property market still remains very weak, which is obviously having uh, knock-on implications for some sectors of shipping, especially on the dry bulk side. However, we don't expect the Chinese economy to worsen, and we do expect to see some tick-up over the course of the next 12 months or so. The European economy has sort of remained lacklustre over the course of 2023, but as we move across and through into 2024, we do expect to see a gradual rebound in activity in the second half of 2024. Uh, If we look for a bright spot globally, I think we have to start focusing on India. Uh, We've seen some strong growth rates in 2023, and we expect to see this continue into 2024. If we look at the shipping markets in general, I'd say that the shipping markets from an earnings perspective have played out as we'd anticipated, certainly over the course of the second half of 2023. We have been surprised by some sectors, certainly sort of the upside that we saw in the dry bulk market at the end of November into the start of December 2023. That surprised us. And of course, we've seen some sustained high earnings for sectors like the car carrier market, and the LPG market of much of 2023. What we have seen, and we don't see this disappearing anytime soon, is heightened market volatility. Now, of course, that has been driven by things like weather-related events in the Panama Canal, where we've seen some limiting on the numbers of vessels traversing the canal and a new waiting system. But of course, the geopolitical events that we've also seen over the course of 2023, which have escalated at the end of 2023. And, you know, as we're sort of recording this podcast, events uh, in and around the Red Sea and the Suez Canal remain rather heightened. We do expect these to have implications, certainly on the short term, for almost all sectors of shipping, how this will play out and how this will impact shipping and supply chains in the sort of medium to longer term will very much be dictated by how the sort of global superpowers deal with uh, events off of Yemen. If we move on to the demand side for 2024, I think across all sectors of shipping, demand is actually looking relatively positive. 
In some cases, such as the container ship market, the chemical tanker market, demand or seaborne trade in 2024 will actually be stronger than we saw in 2023. And we aren't sort of too concerned about the demand side of the, of the industry as a whole. On the supply side of the fundamentals equation, how you view supply will very much be driven by which sector you put under the microscope. For the container ship sector, LNG, car carriers, we're seeing huge order books which will start to be delivered. And we expect to see a lot more tonnage hitting the water over the course of 2024. This will obviously have a detrimental impact on supply demand balances. Whereas for the dry bulk sector, for the oil tanker sector, the order book remains relatively benign and is a positive for market balances as we move across through the next 12 months. So I would say that uh, in general, it's very much a supply side story and the strength in the market is dictated to by the current order books. But we do expect to see this heightened volatility that we have already seen over the course of the last 12 months sort of carry forward into the rest of 2024. Thank you, Adam. There's a lot of different things in there for which we can then sort of now drill down into how they play out in some of those different sectors. The sort of view that overall the global economy is not that strong an outlook, but uh, you've got a lot of other factors, geopolitical coming in, and uh, the actual shipping markets themselves, not too bad a picture, at least in terms of the demand side. If you're enjoying the Sea Trade Maritime podcast, make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing on the app of your choice. So, following on from that broad overview, I'd like to turn to Daniel Richards to talk about the container shipping market and the outlook for 2024. Daniel, welcome back to the Sea Trade Maritime podcast. Thanks for having us back, Marcus. Thank you, Daniel. Now, when we sort of look back at the container shipping market in 2023, it's sort of plunged back into reality following the unprecedented highs of 21 and 2022. This is then combined with the large influx of tonnage that's now starting to hit the water, which was referenced by Adam before. So if we look into 2024, just how bad is that overcapacity going to be? It depends how you measure it, whether you're looking at aggregate global level or whether you're looking at on individual trade lanes or from the perspective of different carriers. But the headline takeaway is that, yes, the industry is going to struggle with overcapacity this year. There are different ways that you can model demand and supply in the container industry, but across the models that ourselves and others use, in general, the balance between demand and supply next year in 2024 is expected to be among the worst years seen over recent decades. Our estimates of 2023 were that the trade side of things, we're still waiting on some data, but that saw a narrow four-year contraction, so that's the third time in four years that world container trade shrank. That was met with supply growth of just over 8% year over year. In 2024, as Adam has mentioned, we do think the trade side and demand side will rebound. We think that in 2024, you will be able to see demand growth of close to around 4% year over year, although we are probably at the more optimistic end of you know, the spectrum of opinions there. However, supply growth is still going to be north of 7% year over year, and this cumulative impact of new deliveries far outpacing removals in the fleet and the ability of line of services to absorb them, it is going to lead to probably major problems of overcapacity in 2024. There's definitely going to be some serious overcapacity there. Have lines actually stopped ordering new tonnage, or are they still continuing to place orders? They've not entirely stopped. The story in 2023 is that the pace of new Mm. orders over the first six to seven months of the year was a lot more elevated than people anticipated at the start of 2023. In the year as a whole, you know, new orders hit about 1.9 million TU, but there was a significant slowdown starting at the end of Q3 and over Q4, where only several hundred thousand TU of new contracts were placed. There are still some rumours out there for some relatively sizable orders, and 
there is going to be continued ordering as some carriers feel the need to start placing orders for alternatively fueled vessels. But yes, compared to where we were six months ago, let alone 12 months ago, carriers are starting to stop adding to the order book so much. But obviously that's only going to sort of have an impact two, three years down the line when those ships are delivered or the the deliveries slow down. Yes, the delivery profile for 2024 and 2025 is completely driven by decisions already made and the ships all being ordered today, unless they're the very small ships, they're not going to be appearing until 2026 or 2027 and beyond. Now, we're seeing a number of other sort of factors coming into play in the container shipping market. We've had the restrictions with the Panama Canal due to the water issues they're having, and more recently, diversions from the Red Sea and Suez Canal around Africa due to the security situation. If we look at these, what impact could these have on the container market as we sort of move into 2024? It's a fast-moving picture. And as we currently understand developments, you're starting to see some diversions away from the Red Sea, major carriers announcing that they're pausing transits through the Red Sea. But we don't know yet how long that will last and how long that disruption will go on for. The longer it does go on for, it is likely to boost container ship freight rates, lengthen transit times for sailings to Europe and to the East Coast from the Far East, and in general, add volatility and degrees of supply chain friction. But it completely depends on how long this lasts, which at this point in time is very hard to see. The Panama Canal situation, you know, there's been a a reduction in the number of transits you're seeing through that passage. Some liner operators, uh, the THE Alliance in particular, have decided to divert services that would normally go through Panama to the East Coast to Suez ratings, which is now becoming a sort of source of complication. But in general, the sort of global or aggregate impact of the Panama Canal doesn't seem that significant. A relatively small number of container ships transited every year, and the Suez routing or the Rand Cape of Good Hope remains an alternative. Where Panama is more likely to have some impact is, you know, some of the sourcing decisions between US East Coast and West Coast that US importers are making, and how in time that might come to impact differential freight rates for those different lanes, and how customers are apportioning their volumes between those locations. Okay. The Panama situation isn't something that's probably going to have that much impact. And obviously, the Red Sea one is very much a wait and see uh, scenario as to how much impact it's going to have. That all being sort of said and done, how does MSI see container freight rates faring in the coming six to 12 months? Overall, quite poorly. If you look at where spot rates on major trades currently sit, you know they're generally back down to levels equivalent to or slightly above or below where they were on the eve of the pandemic. So those, by that measure, the gains of the pandemic era have been eroded. Wider average line of pricing is slightly above where it was on the eve of the pandemic, but again, not far above now. We'd expect a broadly similar picture over the course of next year. As of the time of writing, it's probably likely that there'll be some possibly temporary, possibly more durable spike in short-term freight rates because of the situation in the Red Sea, but that isn't going to affect every trade It isn't necessarily going to affect the freight rates tied to the volumes carriers move under contract. So overall, we probably expect to see a relatively similar picture to today, although there will, of course, be volatility. There will be some volatility around the Lunar New Year in China, which is coming up in the middle of February. But overall, it's going to be a relatively weak year for container freight pricing, provided that the Red Sea situation doesn't endure for a long way into 2024. So most likely a fairly tough year for container shipping. And with that, I'd like to turn our attentions to dry bulk shipping and come to Will Frey. Welcome to the Sea Trade Marathon podcast, Will. Hi, Marcus. Nice to be here. 
Thanks. Now, it's fair to say 2023 was pretty lackluster kind of year for dry bulk, but things have picked up towards the end of the year. Now, that recent spike in the market, is that a positive sign of things to come or is it just a blip? I think it's quite revealing about the state of the market and how tight market balances are. As you say, it's been a fairly disappointing year. Certainly, from the perspective of where we were at the start of the year, there was a lot of expectation that um, China would support the market through some kind of stimulus, and that would lead to stronger steel demand in China, stronger ore trade. And that really hasn't happened. And the market actually has been completely propped up by China's coal imports, uh, which have basically accounted for the increment in dry bulk trade through 2023. So that's kind of saved the market. So what's happening right now is that the market is probably slightly tighter than maybe it should be. And and, um, when we do have these inefficiencies creep in, then you can see situations where the spot markets respond very quickly. And we've touched on volatility before. and It's in some respects a bit of a a cop-out for a forecaster to say things will be very volatile. I think the key thing for dry bulk, though, is, is yes, we can see things be volatile. Is that going to be on an upward trend? or downward trend next year? That's the key question. Okay, so you've got that relatively tight sort of market conditions, and we haven't seen an awful lot of new building orders in dry bulk. So how is that actual demand supply situation? Yeah, well, I think, you know, if we refer to what I said about China's coal trade supporting the market in 2023, I think it's probably wise to start with the demand, actually, and look at what will happen in 2024. We really can't expect to see China importing another increment of 150 million tonnes extra next year. They've done this year. Stockpiles are very high. I appreciate they they now have a mandate to build a strategic coal storage facility uh, over the next few years. But we can't see imports increasing again by such a massive degree. So we think China's coal imports, the best will be flat next year. and More likely will start to decline. They've got very high stockpiles at the moment as well anyway. And that is going to be offset, though, by some other trades that were pretty poor in 2023. And we think we'll actually see a little short-lived uptick in 2024. So European iron ore imports, uh, Japanese ore imports, the markets there have had a very poor 2023. They'll, They'll see slightly better years in 2024. So overall, as Adam mentioned earlier, the demand side, it's not going to be stellar. But it's not going to be awful either because there's going to be other sort of pockets of re-emerging demand as China's coal trade starts to come off a bit. So in that context, then how is this order book going to feed into the market balances? Well, let's not forget that there was quite a few deliveries, 32 million deliveries in 2023. Not a lot of ships scrapped, about 8 million dead weight. We've got another around about 30 scheduled for delivery in 2024. And... What we're expecting to see is, is, is broadly market balances will be sort of matched as where they were in 2023. So that is to say we can't see any strong trend upwards. We think the risk is probably more likely on the downside, but overall they'll be broadly in balance, which is actually at a kind of higher level than it was back in, let's say, 2015, 2016, when that was the sort of the nadir of the previous cycle, market balances were terrible. And I think we've been saved a repeat of that by China's coal imports this year. And you know, things aren't looking too bad. But what I will say is that if, as a result, we're expecting the spot markets to be sort of broadly volatile, a kind of flat trend, actually, we think time charter markets will be weaker year on year. And that, to some respect, reflects the fact that the positivity early last year meant that the time charter market was a quite strong premium to spot rates. Over the years, it sort of converged with time charter rates falling. And you know, next year, year on year, we think those time charter earnings will be weaker. And so for them, you'd be slightly less volatile and probably on a falling trend. So not a particularly good earnings outlook for in terms of rates for the dry bulk shipping companies. No, not really. I mean, as I said, as we'll keep referring to, you know, volatility could provide some kind of short-term strength. But overall, we can't see these lasting long. I mean, obviously, the Suez Canal would affect dry bulk if that was effectively, you know, disrupting trade. To put into context, 
we think the ton miles growth would be rather than 2% next year would be 5% next year if that Suez Canal was closed off for the whole year, let's say. So that gives you an idea of the, the scale of, of impact. So that does suggest that you could see some stronger rates if, if these kind of issues continue for long periods. But assuming they don't, assuming that the, 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 these inefficiencies are kind of short-lived, then no, we can't see rates being much better on a sustained basis year on year. But overall, that's a fairly depressed kind of picture looking forward for the dry bulb market. I'd now like to turn to Tim Smith to talk about the outlook for the tanker sector, one that's, I think, fared rather better. Um, welcome back to the Sea Matter podcast, Tim. Thanks, Marcus. It's great to be back. Thank you, Tim. Um, yeah, so it's been another good, if yeah, somewhat volatile year for tankers, I think it's fair to say. Are we going to look at a repeat of 2023 and 2024? I don't think we'll see a repeat, but I think there's still certainly underlying strength to the outlook and the fundamentals. As you say, 2023 has been characterised by high levels of volatility. We've seen massive swings in spot earnings across different markets, but it's also been characterised by elevation overall strength in terms of earnings. We saw that continue into Q4 2023. And obviously, with the wider kind of geopolitical situation at that time, that's helping as well. One of the other things just to comment on in terms of the tanker sector is how heavily influenced it's been by policy and geopolitical developments. And it's important to recognise that those policy decisions are at both international, national, and even corporate level at present in terms of influence in the market. You know, we can look to OPEC plus in terms of production policy. That's been very cautious, hawkish in terms of cuts in terms of production. Uh, We can look at the US uh, lifting sanctions on Venezuela, introducing further policy changes which will influence trade flow patterns and all this overlays on the backdrop of Russia, Ukraine um, and obviously the huge disruption we've seen to oil markets as a consequence and the wider benefit the tanker sector seen by that redistribution of cargo and the stretching of global trade routes as a consequence. So it doesn't look like that kind of turbulent backdrop from a geopolitical standpoint and a policy position is going to change in 2024. And I think the tanker market tends to benefit from that disruption and certainly has done it or did in 2023. I think when we look at the wider demand side, yeah, touching on the points made earlier on the macro side, we're looking at a slowdown in oil demand growth in 2024. In 2023, we saw a real COVID, post-COVID restrictions uh, rebound in China, and that really dominated oil demand growth in 2023. That's going to ease off as it had done in other regions, which saw those restrictions lifted earlier. So oil demand is going to slow down. Um, we've also got the backdrop of ongoing OPEC plus cuts, which I've mentioned, tightening kind of oil supply. Um, so I think from a wide standpoint, 2024, we'll see underlying demand growth slow down. And I think we've also seen we're we're coming towards the end of the kind of runway for the benefits of all that rerouting of of Russian crude and also sourcing of alternative oil sources, both crude and products in regions like Europe as well. That stretch factor might ease off in 2024. For the tanker sector, though, our view remains relatively positive. We do think earnings are going to ease off overall in 2024 versus 23, um, but the market's underpinned by uh, what we consider to be a very constructive supply side or fleet side. We saw much lower deliveries in 23 for tankers, about 15 million dead weight versus a kind of pre-five-year history average um, of around 25 to 30 million dead weight. Uh, In 24, that's going to drop to um, about 8 million dead weight. So um, the lowest level we've seen since the 80s, um, just two VRCCs expected to be delivered in 24. And that's been as a consequence of very low ordering in the sector. So 
we have seen ordering pick up in the tanker market. We did in 2023. We're going to expect that to continue, but we still have a bit of time before those orders materialize in the market. And alongside that, we do expect scrapping volumes to rise. There is a risk to that. We've seen negligible scrapping in 2023. But again, with the tanker market, there is this wider bifurcation in the fleet between vessels operating and trading sanctioned cargoes and operating out of Russia. Um, that further tightens the market. We've seen a crackdown in Q4 from the US on vessels moving Russian cargo uh, as well. Um, so those elements further tighten the supply side beyond just the kind of overall capacity. Um, and will uh, or are expected to support market conditions in, in 2024. So there's a lot going on in the market all the time. The frequency of events seems to be increasing, and the tanker market is highly exposed to a lot of these geopolitical and policy factors. Um, we expect, though, that the market will moderate in 24, but remain relatively kind of robust in terms of the earnings levels. Yeah, I was going to say, when you say it's going to moderate, could you quantify that to an extent? If we look at um, time charter rates, um, we'd probably be looking at a kind of perhaps 10 to 15 percent reduction. That does depend a little bit on the segment we're looking at. We expect VRCCs to be relatively stronger than, than other markets. And obviously, the mid-sized markets have seen incredibly elevated earnings. I'm talking about Suez Maxes, Aframaxes as a consequence partly of, of, of the Russia situation. We expect those to see a bit more potential downside in 2024. And from a spot market perspective, which is typically more volatile than, than time charter rates, we might expect to see a bit more in terms of the drop on an annual average basis between 23 and 24. So I think it's important just to emphasize the fact that the levels will remain high in a historical context. We're talking about moderation rather than you know, a dramatic drop, and markets have been incredibly strong anyway. So our forecast is, is one of positive earnings levels for the tanker sector, particularly when you look at it in long-term historical context. Yeah, so it's it's yeah, it's a pretty positive picture, and those rates, as you say, from a historical perspective, have been quite strong. The overall level of ordering has still remained quite low from the figures I've seen. Is are there any particular reasons for that that you see? Uh, yeah, I mean, it is it's picking up certainly, and it's um, been concentrated in certain sectors. So in twenty twenty three, we've seen a lot of. LR2 orders, for example, on the product side, as well as MRs, uh, and also Suez Maxes on, on the crude side. I think there's a few reasons in terms of they're driving that kind of reticence in, in ordering. Um, one is uh, relatively high prices. Two is kind of both regulation and um, propulsion and fuel types, um, where we, you know, we speak to um, people in the market who are waiting to see what's going to happen in terms of uh, engine evolution and which kind of fuel type is going to become more prevalent. I think with the tanker sector, it feels to me that owners are happy to enjoy earnings levels as they are without necessarily adding more tonnage, particularly when they have these questions hanging over them and there's a certain potential disadvantage to be moving first in terms of ordering certain fuel type or propulsion types um, when you can wait and see what happens, unless you have a pressing need to renew your fleet. So I think those are some of the key reasons. So you get a bit different from the typical sort of chipping cycle then, actually, as a result of that. Yeah, definitely. And I think these underlying structural factors will be big drivers across shipping sectors through the 2020s. And obviously, well, as we move into the second half of the 2020s, in terms of propulsion choices, and also decarbonisation and the wider energy transition. These are the areas we are looking at very heavily in MSI. I mean, we look at 2024, but we look out even all the way out to 2050. So we pay a lot of attention to these factors. And obviously, they're important for our clients in terms of understanding how these things are going to evolve. back to Adam for the final part of this episode to talk about shipbuilding. Now, I think, Adam, I'll just sort of start off with orders remained high in 2023. What sectors were driving this? 
Yes, you're right, Marcus. New building activity at the shipyards remained very sort of robust over the course of 2023. By our estimates, over the first 11 months of the year, around 66 million GT had been booked at the global shipyards. This was marginally down on 2022, about 9% down, but still very high, predominantly driven by container ship market, certainly in the first half of the year, the gas carrier market, both LNG and LPG, and a continued run on car carriers, huge numbers of car carriers, larger car carriers being built, especially China. China is now dominating the global new building order book for container ships, car carriers, and even bulkers and tankers. And we estimate currently there to be about 102 million GT on order at the Chinese shipyards. Korea comes a distant second if you look at the Korean order book. But the difference with the Korean order book is it's over half of that Korean order book is being made up of gas carriers. Uh, with with a huge number of the LNG orders that we've seen over the course of the last three years, ultimately ending up in Korea. Although the Chinese yards are starting to build more of uh, gas carriers, uh, it certainly remains the preserve of the Korean shipbuilding market. And Japan is still there, but it, it, its order book is only about 20% of what we see currently in China. So there's a huge amount of tonnage currently on the order books at the sort of major shipbuilding nations. Yeah, with that picture, do we expect ordering levels to continue at a sort of similar rate to 2023 and 2024? No, I mean, we do expect uh, orders in 2024 to come off the recent levels. As we say, we've seen a huge number of container ships orders in 2023 and as uh, Dan has sort of alluded to, the market fundamentals don't look as strong in 2024 as they have done over the course of the last few years. There's a lot of tonnage on the order book. So we expect to see uh, uh, certainly fewer container ships being ordered. I think we anticipate us being towards the back end of the current ordering binge for the LNG sector. Uh, so we're not expecting those volumes to be the same in 2024 as we've seen in 2022 and 2023. So you really have to be looking at things like the dry bulk market and the tanker market to sort of really bolster ordering levels in 2024. And as Tim has alluded to, we're still seeing a lot of market participants in dry bulk and the tanker sector sort of sit on the fence and wait to see what happens with new technologies with Uh, new green fuels uh, before launching in and ordering new tonnage. Uh, And it's one of the reasons, if you look at the dry bulk sector, the tanker sector, uh, second-hand prices for modern tonnage remain uh, very high. Uh, I've been referring to them as being very sticky. Rather than taking the risk on new vessels at high new building prices, what they're doing is sort of dipping into the second-hand market and buying modern eco tonnage where the risk is probably a little less certainly over the next five years versus certainly in in perspective of some owners than ordering new tonnage as to say elevated new building prices. Do we have a sort of feel for when we think owners will start to get comfortable with ordering alternative fuel vessels? Obviously we have seen it quite a bit in the container sector, methanol and previously LNG. Uh, dual fuel. Is there some sort of sense as to when owners will start placing more orders in tankers and dry bulk? Yeah, I mean, we, we sort of have a, a contracting going up significantly in dry bulk and tankers sort of in the second half of this decade, so as we sort of move from 2026 out to 2028. Uh, I do think, though, that it's very much dependent on the size of the vessel that is being ordered. I think certainly speaking to some smaller handy size dry bulk owners, I can't see some of those owners ordering sort of dual fuel ammonia or dual fuel methanol vessels for some time to come because they have huge concerns about the availability of fuel 
given the, the, the nature of their operations and where they have to ultimately bunker their vessels. What we're certainly seeing, I think, on those smaller sides is a huge push towards uh, installing energy saving technologies, uh, whether that be sort of flat rotors, sails, ducts, air lubrication, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are still some huge operational savings that can be made from both a fuel and an emission standpoint. So it seems that the, the efforts are being placed more there than on the sort of dual fuel technology side of decarbonisation and reducing emissions within those individual sectors. So good news for the manufacturers of those sort of devices. Just more broadly, in terms of capacity on the shipbuilding side, is it tight uh, as you look forward? I think if you wanted to go and place an order at a tier one Korean, Chinese, Japanese yard, you're probably going to be looking at earlier to 2027 delivery date. I think there are still slots available if you wanted to order, say, a sub Cape vessel at a tier two Chinese yard. You can probably squeeze one in in 2026, one or two in 2026. The Japanese yards remain more difficult to sort of pinpoint just because talking to shipbrokers, looking at the data, there's still a lot of vessels that we think are being built as stock boats at the Japanese yards, vessels that have unknown owners. Uh, we think a lot of these are sort of being identified for the Japanese owning community. One of the interesting things when you do look at the order book is just how front-loaded the order books are for 2024. If you look at China, we're anticipating on, from the scheduled deliveries about 35 million GT of tonnage is scheduled to be delivered in 2024. So that 35 million GT compares with an average output of around 25 million GT over the course of the last three years. If everything hit the water, uh, output would come up by around 10 million GT in China. In Korea, comparable statistics, that Korea is scheduled to output 23 million GT in 2024. The average for the last three years has only been 16 million GT annually. So again, a huge uplift in output if the scheduled deliveries numbers are to be believed. We do think that we will see significant slippage in 2024. And that, if anything, is going to put added pressure on those years 2025, 2026, because a lot of the tonnage that should have been delivered in 2024 won't hit the water. So that will potentially help the market balances. When we talk about the individual sectors, we won't see all the tonnage hitting the water that should have done. But what it does is push tonnage out means that delivery slots will be further out into the future. And also, unless we see cancellation, that tonnage is going to hit the water at some time, which will ultimately have a detrimental impact for supply demand balances. We are seeing some new shipyards and some new capacity come online. We've identified more than 12 new yards that were mothballed that have been reactivated come online over the course of the last couple of years. We don't see any of those yards currently sort of getting back up to the sort of pre-mothballed capacity levels, but they will certainly help with some of the sort of tightness within the shipbuilding market. And in aggregate, we expect to see shipyard capacity rise by about 5% by 2025 when we compare it to 2021. And that obviously puts the industry in, in a good position when we do start seeing a lot more dry bulk and oil tanker orders happen in the sort of second half of this decade. There'll be more capacity to meet this sort of incremental replacement requirement that we're anticipating, given that the, the fleets for both oil tankers and bulkers are, are getting older and there will be a need to move to more sort of dual fuel or, or zero carbon fuels as we move out into the next decade. Okay, so it's quite an interesting picture going forward for the, the shipbuilding sector. And obviously that plays back into all the sectors that we have just been talking about. 
I think with that, I'd like to wrap up this episode. It's been fascinating getting MSI's views on the outlook for 2024 and somewhat beyond that in some cases there. Now, it would be great to come back and talk to you perhaps in end of June, start of July, and see where we're at in mid-2024. With that, I'd like to thank Adam, Will, Daniel, and Tim for your time and uh, talking to us today. Thank you very much, Marcus, and thank you for inviting us back. 